Well, thank you very much. It's uh, delightful to be here from Alabama. Um, the girl said just as he was leaving that it's never too early to start thinking about a reimbursement plan, and he talked about the value proposition argument. And that just sets, um, sets me up absolutely perfectly for what I'm going to be talking about, which is about those two ideas, but in a rather more specific way about how one can actually go about that. So I'll be talking about health economics, as I call it, from the supply side. And uh, I imagine that if I did that... Uh, oh, yeah, there we are. Uh, so everybody knows, if the basic textbook, that when you in, uh, invest in a technology, uh, at the left side of the graph here, you expect to get your money back and make lovely big profits and have a nice big uh, right side. And every textbook will tell you that's what you have to do and talk about discounting. But um, as the previous speakers have said, increasingly uh, making that net profit uh, depends on showing that your treatment is cost effective. That is to say that by putting it into the health service, it will put more value than the things it displaces, given that you can only spend the same dollar once. Now, most health economics that you read about uh, is health economics which is done at the demand side. So I used to work on the, um, on the rationing panel, the, the guidance panel of NICE, called by Mayor Giuliani the death panel. Uh, and there we were doing health economics at the demand side, and virtually all the literature is on that, and I won't labour it because you know most of the stuff. You know, for example, that uh, your product can be looked at in terms of its benefit on the x-axis and its cost on the y-axis. And doing that uh, defines technologies into four quadrants. And, um, uh, uh, and, and if you're in business, you will put yourself in the north-east uh, quadrant, the top right-hand quadrant. And your product will be reimbursed if it falls below a line which defines the opportunity cost in the economy concerned. So if you're in Norway, that line will be steeper than if you're in South Sudan, where it'll be very flat indeed. But nevertheless, there's a point, a nominal point, uh, at which it's a, you'll take more value out of the health service by putting your new technology in than, uh, than if you didn't put it in. And that's the underlying ax axiom, as you know. So all that you know, and here's just some, some examples in the UK, uh, well, in England, really, the threshold the society is willing to pay through NICE for a quality-adjusted life year, for a healthy life year, is, equivocates between 20 and 30,000 pounds per year. Uh, and so if you're below that bottom line, you're in the reimbursable area, and if you're above, you're not in the reimbursable area. So I did some work for a company... I wish I could find that apparatus of pointing. I did some work for a company um, and, uh, on tissue engineered bladder, and that came in below the line. Uh, also for heart pumps, and more on heart pumps just now, because of course that's what you're going to displace with cellular therapy, uh, you claim that was way above the line. Um, of course, there's some things that come in below the line. They are cost-saving to the health service. But if you're in business and you're down below the line, then you're a fool. Uh, and you should get up above that, uh, that, that line. Um, so that is, that is health economics at the, um, at, the, at the demand side, when you're making a choice about whether to, to support this, this treatment in your service. Um, but like the previous speaker, I don't think you should wait until NICE or CEM or the insurance companies reject your technology. You should start planning much earlier than that while it is still in the idea and development stages. So that's what I'll be talking about, is how you may think about that problem. That is health economics at the supply side. Now, while health economics at the supply side draws on the same fundamental axioms as it does on the demand side, it is a different thing in some respects. Uh, and so I'll take you through the rest of this talk. I'll take you through these, these nuances. Well, they're more than nuances, these important differences between uh, demand side and supply side health economics. So the first, of course, is the issue of cost and price. When we were looking at NICE, we just looked at the price, um, but uh, the net price. 
But um, when you're at the demand side, you have to break that price down more. First of all, you must take any extra costs uh, at the health service has to pay for and subtract those. Of course, you might, it might be a gain. You may save costs in the health service, but those have to be factored into the decision. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and then that, that leaves the headroom, uh, as we call it, the commercial headroom, which you can exploit. Uh, as I say, that might, be, that might be quite large if it saves money rather than, rather than spends money in the health service. Nevertheless, that is a commercial headroom that you can exploit. And that headroom itself, that commercial headroom itself, breaks down into the unit cost of the device. I'm ignoring here repaying the money you've had to borrow to get you to that position. That must also be factored in, of course. But forget living that out to make life simple, the unit cost, and then, of course, your profit margin, which just to encourage you, I've made rather big uh, in this, but it might not be there at all. Uh, and from that comes a very simple equation. And if you remember this equation, it's the health service cost plus lambda, which is what you prepare to pay for a unit of health benefit in your economy. I'm told it's about $45,000 uh, in terms of actually observing behavior in the United States, uh, multiplied by the number of quality adjusted life years that you gain. Actually, there should be a minus sign in front of the health service cost, which becomes positive if the health service costs are saving. So that's the, the, the headroom then, and I'll give you now a little example of a back of the envelope calculation um, on the, the headroom. It's the example I always use because it's so nice and easy and simple and explains it so nicely. Uh, this deals with a kind of cellular therapy. It's for urethral uh, stricture, a long urethral stricture, uh, which you might, you, might, uh, you might get. And the current gold standard treatment for this is a um, uh, is to take a, a, a flap of skin from the inside of the cheek, from the buccal mucosa, uh, and use that as a graft to make good the area that is, that is covered by the stricture. Um, so we wanted to work out whether that tissue-engineered solution uh, would be better for a client uh, in, a, in a company in France. Uh, and, um, and so we, we did this as follows. We assumed that the tissue-engineered urethra gives perfect um, uh, quality of life, um, but uh, we took into account the side effect of having a painful incision in the mouth to remove this piece of skin, and then we calculated the headroom for this, to, this uh, treatment to be effective. And we did it like this, and it's very, very simple. Uh, first of all, we found out we got an estimate of the utility loss from having a large hole in your, in your cheek, uh, which we calculate, which we, which we find to be 0.94, where perfect life, as you know, is one and death is zero. And from experts, we found that this can be expected to last for about one month, 0.1 of a year, approximately. And that gave a quality, a quality a loss due to that of 0.0062. But we had to factor in also the saving in theatre time from having, not having to take out this, uh, this uh, buccal mucosa. And there we are, there's your equation again, health service uh, cost minus, plus the uh, lambda, 20,000 to 30,000 pounds, I made it here, uh, times the number of qualities. And there you get the headroom, the commercially expressed, as just over 400 pounds. So provided you can bring your, your, uh, your new product in for 400 pounds or less, you will be in profit. And that can be expressed in the next slide here. So if it's more than 411 pounds, you're not going to be making any profit uh, at all. But once it gets to 400 pounds, as you get less and less, uh, cheaper and cheaper, so your profit rate uh, shoots up accordingly. Now, in this particular case, this particular case, there's no way you can come up with a tissue engineer construct for 411 pounds, I guess. Uh, and so the company, in fact, decided not to proceed with this technology on the basis of their understanding of the model which we presented to them. But it's a very simple and nice example of, of not having to fire, hire a very expensive economist for a long period of time. Uh, just a, a short piece of work will can, can provide insight uh, uh, there into, in, into the headroom that's there. So that's the first point about uh, this, is the, is, the, is the use of cost and price um, to come up with a rapid calculation. We call it the headroom method of whether your product is likely to look viable at all or whether you should just go home for tea. 
Now, the next, the next thing, the important point to put across, and this is a complete difference between this and, and the demand side, health economics, is the use of decision gates. So imagine, imagine you've done a, you've done a, um, a, 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 a headroom or a, an assessment, and you've found that, um, that your product is above the line. Your best estimate is that it's above the line in the unreimbursable area. And you think to yourself, well, I'm, uh, I'm, thinking I'm very early in stage, but it doesn't look propitious, it's above the line, I'm going to abandon it. But wait, you see here that there's a lot of uncertainty, as represented by these ellipses, a lot of uncertainty about whether it will really be below the line or not. In fact, there's quite a lot of probability but, uh, that it will be in the profit area, and some probability that it will be strongly in the profit area. Are you really doing the right thing in abandoning it at this point simply because your best estimate is above the line? At the demand side, that's the best estimate. You've got to go with that. But at the supply side, you don't have to. And the secret is in the, is in the decision gate. You, don't forget, we're talking early in the development of this new technology. So you've put in some sunk costs already to take to this position, but you've got a long way to go. And you can have another, another uh, decision gate downstairs, uh, further down. So, so, so you can, uh, you can uh, uh, exploit this decision gate. And I'll give you a, a worked example of that here. So imagine that you are at that, at that uh, decision box there, right at the left of the slide. You can abandon it now because it looks, the best estimate is above the line. It looks like it's not reimbursable. Or you can go ahead to a trial, for the trial in inverted commas. It could be seeing whether the thing works in, in vitro, but to the next decision gate. Um, at which point you'll have a positive result and take it to market, or a negative result, in which case you'll abandon it. Now, uh, imagine you've got an idea for, a, 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 use the word device here, it could be a cell therapy, and you've talked to just two experts. Uh, and they're both equally plausible. And the one says he expects, or she expects, 0.4 collies per patient when he uses this. It's got a quite big effect. The other is much more pessimistic, only 0.1 collie per patient. But the surgical cost of putting this thing in is £3,000. Then what? Well, according to expert one, uh, you're going to make uh, £9,000 per device. According to expert two, naught pounds and if you average them, them being equally plausible, you expect to make £4,500. That's your, your, your commercial headroom. And if your production costs are £5,000, then you're above the line. Your projected loss is going to be £500, and you won't go for it. But you'd be wrong to not go for it if you have a decision gate, um, because you can see that there's quite a lot of probability, in fact, uh, almost half, that you're going to make money out of this thing. So what you can do is take it to the decision gate, and that won't take us through the mathematics, but if you have a decision gate, you assume that the decision has got a half chance of going either way, and then recalculate it just on that basis, you see you come up with an expected value that is the value of a product at the early stage, the value proposition, I think Gil called it. Your value proposition now has gone from minus 500 pounds to, what is it, two, plus 2,000 pounds. So you can see... Having a decision gate, it gives you, gives you um, a, better, um, a, a, a better way of making a decision. So you must factor that in when you're on the, uh, on the supply side. Now, in that example I gave you, uh, you must have been shaking your heads when I said you've got two experts and one says this and one says that. In reality, you've got lots of experts and they have a range of possibilities at all. So the next thing to take into account is the great parameter uncertainty that you have at the early stages of development. What to do about that? So take this case, I told you I'd come back to the implantable pump, but this could be the implantable or um, cell, myocardial cell, um, uh, for treatment of heart failure. This was in fact a pump, and I was asked by the then Director General of Research and Development, should a trial be funded of the newest generation of uh, non-axial pump? Um, and, uh, and so we, we did an uh, analysis based on that. We went to America, where they, the surgeons had lots of experience with a pump, and we obtained their Bayesian priors. 
Uh, and this is an amalgamated price. So each surgeon who, who'd used it, had experience of pumps gave us his or her uh, individual uh, Bayesian prior, their best estimate and the range within which they thought it was plausible that the effectiveness of the pump would fall. We amalgamated those into a, into a single prior, uh, and then we factored in quality of life, uh, health service costs, on which there was some information, and put it all together and came up now with this blue line, the prior for the uh, quality gain from, from this, the, uh, for, from this uh, left ventricular device. And you can see that there's some probability that it would actually subtract, subtract health benefit, but most of it was positive. Um, and the middle, the, the, the mean and mode of that distribution is that, it was, if it, that, that, that the most probable result was one which would, would become cost effective if the device itself cost 13,000 13, pounds in our money. Um, and we spoke to experts at that stage. The device was very, very expensive, and they, they said the most they thought Moore's law could take it down to would be about £20,000. Um, and so it looked, it looked to us as though that, that, that was not, uh, not, going to, not going to be a viable uh, proposition. Um, the break-even price would be £20,000, and there's only a 28% probability that it would be that effective or more. But we've left out the decision value, decision gate. Because don't forget, you will not develop the device unless it, go, it, it start, comes out as propitious on the test. In other words, unless you end up in that top 28%. Otherwise, all you've got to worry about is the cost of getting to that decision gate. So you can think about it in terms of, well, let us say we get there, if we get to that point, if, if, if we end up in the yellow, we'll abandon it. But if we end up in the green, we're in potential profit and we'll take it. The question is how much? Well, you take the mean of that area which puts you in the profit. The middle of that area is 31K. And you'll only, so that is your expected value if you go ahead, can be calculated as a 28%, the probability that, that you're going to go ahead, multiplied by, by um, uh, the difference between 20K and 31K, 11K. And so there, seen like that, uh, it looks a better prospect. All you should do, you can do is pay for uh, the study to take you to the point where you can make that decision. So that's an example uh, a run over a distribution. One of the interesting things that comes out of this is that, is that other things being equal, that, that, that sentence is terribly important, other things that being equal, when you're designing something, counterintuitive at first perhaps, the more uncertain you are, the greater the expected value of your product. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it sounds, uh, un but if you put uncertainty in, if, you've, if your uncertainty has got a standard distribution of 0.4 SDs, there, then you can see at £13,000 best estimate, you're, you have much bigger expected value given uncertainty. And it's at first counterintuitive, but the, it's not when you think, hang about, I'm going to put down a small investment to get to the decision gate, and then the more uncertain I am, the more there's some distribution right over there from which I might make a huge profit. And, of course, that's the justification, if you think about it, for government investment in blue skies research. Most of it won't go anywhere. But when it does, it might be a blockbuster that is really transformative. So that, then, is, um, uh, is uh, some essence of that subject. Um, there are also pricing issues. I haven't got time to go into pricing issues now. We have written a paper on this, and we've come up with a quite a strange result, that under almost all circumstances... Uh, it's, you, you, when you do your headroom calculation, um, you should, if you want to factor in uncertainty about the price, because as you know, NICE will never say exactly what it will play. I'm sure it's the, the sort's the same with the CEM. You don't know exactly how much they're going to pr pr price, uh, pay. If you factor in uncertainty, you should factor in, price it at 20% below the max, below its, below its, um, below the, below the point at which it would reimburse you on the, on the straightforward economic model. And we've got a publication to say, to, to explain that. It's, it's, it's quite elegant. To be honest, I don't even understand the maths myself. So I work with a very good mathematician called, um, called uh, Alan Gurley. Um, so just to summarise, what we're really talking about is making decisions under uncertainty. And the important part of that uncertainty is the resolvable uncertainty. 
So when you start out in life, you've, you know, there, there, there are uncertainties about whether you can even build the thing or whether, the, whether you can get a myocyte to contract even in a Petri dish would have been uncertain at some point in time. Um, and then there'll be the production costs, which uh, you imagine quite early on in the process, you'll get a very good idea about what it's going to cost to produce this thing. Uh, and then it gets more difficult, uh, the effect on, on service pathways and how cost-releasing it will be. Gil was talking about long-term benefits, not having to care for patients with stroke and so on. So that is a, but, but largely resolvable uncertainty. And the health benefit, in fact, those two are often very closely linked, like two goats uh, tethered together, because the more the clinical benefit, if, especially for regenerative medicine, the law, better the long-term outcome will be for the patient as well. So they move together uh, uh, very often. And, and those really make up the resolvable uncertainty that you can have before you go to market. Of course, there are unresolvable uncertainties, which you will still have even when you go to market, especially about the, um, the behavior of your, comp of your competition and, uh, uh, and changes in the politics of the world and so on. Um, so really all this is about resolvable uncertainty. And this final slide, for which there's a lot of mathematics behind, um, uh, uh, just uh, tries to show that, that the value of the premium uh, that you get from developing to the next decision gate, the option value, if you could, you could call it, the value of having an option uh, in, your, in your development pathway, that value is greatest when, you're, when your expected value, where you're standing uh, at the moment, breaks equally one way or the other, when you're sort of almost indifferent between making a decision. Then you get a massive value. When you, when you are right out here and your projected cash flow is enormous or nugatory, you haven't got much value from resolving that uncertainty because, well, in the, in the first case is a no-brainer. They're both no-brainers, in effect. And so the urethral example, you wouldn't need to go through a whole more complicated option value appraisal because it lay, seemed to lie anyway, uh, outside of the possibilities for the, op for, the, for the option appraisal to be itself cost-effective. In other words, a, a more elaborated health economic model wouldn't have been worth it itself. It would be cost ineffective to do a cost-effectiveness model. Um, so that sort of sums up some of this, some of this, uh, some of this thinking. Um, of course, all this is based on a sort of rational view of the world, that, it, that health economics is, is the way things are decided. Uh, of course, it's not always like that. This is what happened in one of NICE's very first things that they, they decided not to reimburse the drugs for multiple sclerosis, uh, and, um, uh, and that brought a public outcry, and the government found a way out of that in the so-called risk-sharing scheme. Um, we, we have uh, a, a workbook which you might want to acquire. This work has been funded by the EPSRC through their MATCH program. To whom I'm very grateful. We have a workbook which you can acquire from us, which goes through the mathematics of all this in more detail. Um, and we have various publications which uh, I've included with the slides, which, to which you are more than welcome. And so at that point, thank you very much indeed.